Welcome uh, everyone to this uh, afternoon session and, and first and foremost welcome to our panelists uh, to our uh, session titled Hard Security Perspectives on Climate Change Real Threat or Hype and I must admit that I've been uh, myself looking forward uh, to this uh, session uh, throughout this forum because uh, one of the purposes with this forum is really to try to bring together the hard security voices uh, with the more developmental oriented uh, uh, discussions on, on peace. Uh, we have called it trying to bring the Munich community together with the, the fragility community of the World Bank in a way, so to really have hard security voices meet uh, the development side of the peace discussions. And I think this panel in these uh, two days really represents uh, the hard uh, security voices. I'm also intrigued by the title, um, uh, Threat or Hype? I mean, is this really uh, only about security folks like yourselves wanting to be part of the climate attention and resources? 
uh, or is it really the climate people who want to you know, open all the doors, including the security? Or is there really something to it here? And we look forward to, to hear that. Uh, and if it is a threat, you know, what, what is that threat? Uh, and, and what are the real implications for, uh, for defense and military? Um, uh, also, how it relates, of course, then to other actors and how the defense and military side can relate to other actors like uh, humanitarian uh, or development. So there are a lot of questions out there. We have uh, a fascinating panel uh, online. We have with us Honorable Melissa G. Dalton, Assistant Secretary of Defense for Homeland uh, Defense and Hemispheric Affairs at the Department of Defense in Washington. Uh, very good to have you with us, Melissa. I hope you can hear us. Perfect. Yes, yes, I can hear you. Can, uh, can you all hear me? Yes, we do. Excellent. Perfect. We also Thank have uh, Kemel, uh, Kevin Hamilton, Director General, uh, International Security Policy Global Affairs in Ottawa, Canada. Good to have you with us, Kevin. Thank you. Great to be here. And uh, we have here in the room uh, Major General Munir Munirusaman from Bangladesh and also Major General uh, Lena Maria Persson Herlitz uh, from the Swedish uh, uh, Armed Forces. Uh, all of you, very uh, warm welcome. I think we'll uh, jump straight into uh, the discussions. And I'll begin with you, uh, Melissa, in Washington. Uh, I mean, we, uh, Pentagon was early on setting out climate change as one of their priorities, uh, maybe before uh, many of uh, the rest of us had kind of captured the, the link with security. And this was something that also survived through uh, the Trump administration, as far as we understand, and is now uh, also a part of the newly revised national uh, defense strategy. So, I mean, can you set out for us some of the lessons learned, having been early on the ball here, uh, you know, from, from, from past uh, work, but also how you see uh, you tackling climate uh, security risks going forward? You know, why is this important to you? Uh, don't you have other more important things uh, to care about? <laughs> Great. Well, well, good morning, everyone, and thank you so much uh, for ha having me join you all today for this important discussion. Um, I'm delighted to participate in today's event along such distinguished colleagues. Climate change is reshaping the geostrategic environment, exacerbating existing risks, and creating new challenges for U.S. national security and defense. As Secretary Austin has stated, no nation can find lasting security without addressing the climate crisis. Given the profound security implications, I'm gratified to report that our department is working hard to reduce its contribution to climate change while building resiliency to climate impacts internally and with our allies and partners. There are several steps the department is taking to address the challenge of climate change. First, we are recently stood up an office under my team uh, that is focused on Arctic policy and global resilience. Second, as you noted in your introductory question, the department is also taking important steps towards integrating climate change con considerations into the full suite of our strategic documents, notably the National Defense Strategy, or NDS, that we've recently transmitted to the U.S. Congress. These developments reflect the degree to which climate change is changing the strategic context. The NDS makes clear that the department must adapt to this new operating environment. Third, I also want to note this administration built our budget request in direct response to the objectives of our national defense strategy, including historic levels of funding requested to combat the effects of climate change on our military. Fourth, the implications of climate change are being integrated into other key documents, including a climate risk analysis and a climate adaptation plan, both of which were released last fall. The risk analysis was the first report on the strategic implications of climate change, while the adaptation plan was part of a long-standing concern about the impact that climate change has on our military installations and operations. I'd like to just say a few points more about the risk analysis in particular. The impacts of climate change, whether it be from extreme storms, heat wave events, wildfires, or other consequences, stress defense resources at home and abroad. Climate change also shapes demands for military missions, including increasing demand for domestic support of civilian authorities and humanitarian assistance and disaster relief operations abroad. Climate change also cha challenges our ability to carry out our missions by making it harder to perform functions or logistics due to extreme heat, storms, 
water scarcity, or other impacts. It also degrades access, basing, and overflight op options for the department, and it makes it more difficult to schedule exercises, which can be disrupted by extreme weather events. In addition, climate change poses cross-cutting ri risks in key regions around the world. For example, we see in the Arctic food prices and resource competition on migration and on state fragility are increasingly stressed. Those effects can cascade beyond country borders and regions. Climate change affects how partners and competitors make strategic decisions, and how we respond to climate change also influences the competitive landscape, including the political and economic benefits of clean technology. But it won't be enough for the Department of Defense or the United States more broadly to take action on its own. Other countries face similar risks, and this challenge requires action by all of us. Many countries see climate change as one of the biggest, if not the biggest, threats that they faced. Based on how often climate change comes up in our bilateral discussions in the department, it is clear that supporting partner countries around the world in adapting to climate change is important for U.S. national security. We are working in close coordination with our civilian agencies, as well as with allies in multilateral forums, to identify how DOD can support our partners and allies. These include a revived Defense Environmental International Cooperation Program, a way for the department to support allied and partner activities in this space. We are also sharing with a number of allies the Defense Climate Assessment Tool, an online mapping platform to assess the exposure risk of military installations. In closing, it's not enough to wait for the impacts of climate change to come to pass. We have to be proactive by taking action to reduce our risks to installations, our troops, our missions, through adaptation, but also by doing our part to reduce the department's environmental footprint. We can't do that alone, but we aim to do so by working closely with our allies and partners. Thank you so much. Well, thank you, Melissa. Can I just have a, a follow-up question? Would you be able to be, I mean, you outlined the risks very eloquently. Would you be able to explain when you say about being uh, proactive, taking action, you know, what are the more operational implications? What do you do differently? Could you point to a couple of examples to make this more real for us in more terms of uh, what, what, what it operationally, may, uh, how it makes a difference operationally? Absolutely. Um, so there's a number of ways that we are looking at impacts on the on the operational front. Um, one is by looking to um, enhance the resilience of our operational uh, energy sources, um, such that we are reducing the reliance on um, fossil fuels um, and, and other um, types of, of uh, fuels that um, are not climate sensitive or, or climate resilient. Um, and this is also important when considering some of the contested environments that we might find ourselves um, active in in a crisis or, or contingency where um, bringing in um, diesel fuel, for, for example, could prove uh, quite challenging um, in some of those contested environments. Mm. Uh, and so uh, building uh, our, our reserves and reliance instead on um, renewable energy, more green sources of energy um, can actually make a lot of sense um, in, in those types of operating environments as well. Another area from an operational perspective that we're very focused on is uh, the impact that um, sea level rise and storm surges can have um, in places like the Indo-Pacific, where mm. we are very reliant upon access and basing overflight nodes um, with mm. our allies and partners, uh, particularly in the Pacific Islands, for certain mm. crises and contingencies that might emerge in that region. And so um, the specter of um, increasing climate stressors is something that we need to be factoring in, in terms of how we improve our operational resiliency. Uh, it has posture implications for specific installations in that region. Um, mm. And so we very much look forward to working forward uh, with allies and partners to address mm. those challenges. Great. Thank you so much, Melissa. I guess that one of those allies will, might be Canada. And uh, we now turn to uh, Kevin. Uh, you have been applying, or maybe not you, but Canada uh, has been applying for uh, a NATO center of excellence on climate security. Can you maybe elaborate for us on what uh, uh, the role of military alliances could be in, in a changing climate? And, and what do you foresee for this center? How can it make a difference? 
Sure, well, thank you. Um, perhaps I can begin by, in one sentence, sort of answering the broader question for this panel, which is, you know, is it real threat or, or is it hype? Our, our governments and militaries just, uh, just joining on a bandwagon um, that was established um, by, first and foremost, by civil society. Um, I think the answer is, no, this is a real threat. Um, the climate change long term is arguably the number one um, threat to humanity. And so our societies, uh, including our militaries, um, need to take action. Um, I'll also just take a moment to, uh, to thank Cypria and the government of Sweden for allowing me to be here. Um, Canada really recognizes and appreciates Sweden's global leadership on the subject of climate change and on climate and security in particular. Um, and we look forward to expanding our cooperation uh, with Sweden and other global partners in, on this topic. You mentioned the um, NATO Center of Excellence on Climate Change and uh, Security, uh, which Canada is in the process of, um, of establishing. Um, we had hoped, of course, to work with Sweden um, as a partner, as a NATO partner in this uh, initiative. Um, but very soon, we hope to work with Sweden as an ally as a full ally and uh, we are even just this week um, hosting the first establishment conference for this uh, center of excellence uh, here in Ottawa and uh, hope that it will be formally announced at the Madrid summit in June and that it will be up and running as a full NATO COE uh, by next year. Um, the center itself, for those of you who aren't familiar, NATO centers of excellence are like little military academies but focused on one set of discrete issues to develop doctrine and best practices um, in one particular area. And um, climate change and the nexus between climate change and security was one area where that was lacking, frankly, in, in NATO's planning. But in the last couple of years has, has really been ramped up because we recognize uh, as an alliance of um, 30, soon to be, soon to be 32 uh, allies uh, that, um, uh, we, we need to adapt. Uh, we need our militaries to be responsive in the face of uh, climate change challenges. We want to, the intent at least, is to uh, build our center of excellence around three thematic pillars. Um, awareness, adaptation, mitigation. So taking those each in turn, awareness is of course developing an understanding of the many the complex ways that climate change will impact security, right from the smallest tactical level up to the geostrategic level. Um, it will be critical to have um, baseline observations, and analyze how security impacts uh, different uh, groups and individuals, uh, with some at disproportionate risk uh, due, to, due to existing vulnerabilities. In some parts of the world, women and girls, uh, indigenous peoples, um, marginalized group, um, and also an un a baseline understanding of the complex interplay between climate change and uh, mm -hmm. conflict. Second, adaptation. Uh, once the challenges are identified and understood, we have the need to, of course, address them. And that could mean changes to the way we procure or build or maintain defense infrastructure or mm -hmm. equipment, could uh, portend changes in tactics, force structure, training schedules, it could also affect the way we think about security. Um, climate change only highlights the need for an integrated approach between preventive security, so enhancing resilience at the outset and addressing systemic vulnerabilities um, to reactive security, which is of course addressing insecurity as it arises, uh, as wrought by, by climate change. Third, mitigation. Um, this comes down to the fact that there's a degree of climate disruption that we cannot adapt to. Uh, and therefore, we're going to need an ambitious uh, cuts to greenhouse gas emissions and to limit global warming. Uh, this is a global imperative and the defense sector will need to play its part. So this is a challenge, you know, given the need for militaries to prioritize operational effectiveness. Um, but there are some cases too where reducing emissions could boost operational effectiveness. For example, forward operating bases, uh, which are less reliant on fossil fuels, uh, could reduce reliance on uh, fuel chain supply convoys, which would be under normal circumstances vulnerable to attack or, or to disruption. So for our center of excellence, um, which we hope to establish uh, very soon, um, these are the, the main themes that will be explored um, mm. by civilians, by military personnel, uh, and we hope with uh, strong interaction with academia and civil society. 
very interesting uh, to hear your plans there and, and um, uh, looking forward to, to engage with you on that, of course, and to be able to draw on that center of excellence going forward. Uh, we now turn to the room uh, and to uh, Major General uh, Munir Utsaman. And, and let me begin by just thanking you for having uh, made your way to Sweden, to Stockholm. I'm happy that we can at least provide with nice weather at this time of the, uh, of the year. Uh, but really, thank you for, for the effort of being here. And I'm sure also uh, there are many uh, here who are keen to talk to you in the, uh, in the, in the coffee breaks of, of these meetings. Uh, you know, you, uh, and, and especially also uh, coming from Bangladesh, uh, a, a country uh, very much effect affected by climate uh, impacts, of course. Uh, you have worked some 40 years uh, on, on these issues. Uh, uh, you have uh, chaired the climate or the Global Military Advisory Council on climate change. So, you know, both in your role uh, of having, you know, uh, had active duty, but also in your role as, as chair of this advisory council, what, what really have you learned uh, about the role of military? What, what, are, what are the risks that you see and what is uh, the role of defense of the military in responding to, to those risks? Thank you. Uh, first of all, let me thank Cipri for this opportunity to be here this afternoon, speak to you, ladies and gentlemen. First, what is the threat landscape of climate change? Climate change is an all-encompassing threat. It touches all aspects of life, society, state, the international system. So it touches food security, water security, energy security, touches livelihood security, it touches on health security. So all aspects of life and being able to survive is now being threatened by climate change. But the problem then graduates. The levels of threat is increasing as impacts of climate change increases. As the environmental degradation continues and climate change increases its threat, there are points in impacts where securitization is necessary. It's a point when the state is unable to cope with the challenge and the threat in the normal response mechanism. And that point of securitization then brings in the role of the military. The role of the military is even more critical in states which are small and fragile and also are threatened by climate change more than states which have bigger capacity. For the reason that in the state's mechanism to respond in those cases, the military is a critical asset for the state and it cannot be factored out. So therefore, in all states, big and small, depending on the degree of vulnerability, the military is a critical tool in the hand of the state to be incorporated in the response mechanism of the state. So in terms of the human security, what we have seen so far, the military has been brought in a number of cases. We have seen very recently how the military was brought in to meet the challenges of the COVID-19 pandemic that we have recently experienced. But even more than that, what I worry more as a soldier is the prospect of hot war in terms of climate change impacts or what you should be calling hard security, non-traditional non or human security. There are several areas that we scan around the world where we see the pot potential and the possibility that impacts of climate change, if it is not managed well, can bring in the possibility of not only hard security issues, but interstate conflict. Let us begin by water. Water will be a critical element of tensions and potential conflict between states. I'll give you the specific examples in my own region first. There is a growing tension of water sharing between China and India and the Tibet Plateau over the sharing of the Burma Butter water which is a critical water system, not only for China and India, but the rest of South Asia. There is strategic writing available, open source, you can see and Google, that most strategic writings in India indicate that if there is a unilateral withdrawal of Brahmaputra water in the Tibetan Plateau by China, it means conflict. We cannot afford to lose water. 
I see similar statements coming from former foreign minister of Pakistan, Mr. Aziz, saying that unilateral withdrawal of water in the Indus Treaty by India in the upper Kashmir riparian region is a declaration of war. So we are not only talking of theories, we are now talking about the real possibility of hydro conflict between states which also have a history of war and conflict and unresolved disputes. These are also states which are having the biggest standing armies in the world. These are also states that have nuclear capacities. So we are here talking about very high stake potential for possibility of tension and conflict. Mm. I also see the possibility of tension developing in the high north in the Arctic as resources open, as new sea roads open, there is possibility that states will be racing to grab and capture. And those strategic competition, if not managed well, can again result in possibility of conflict between nations. Look at the maritime space. The island states in the Pacific will disappear in the coming years. The state of Maldives will disappear altogether. These are small states with small population, but they have a huge EZ and continental shelf. We don't know when they disappear, whose water is going to be. Will it remain the space for those states that once existed there, or it becomes international water? Mm. If that is ambiguity, I'm sure states like China will race to the Pacific to get hold of this area. Mm. If that happens, that is a strategic competition, if not managed well, can again result in tension and conflict. So the possibility of climate-induced conditions bringing up the possibility of interstate conflict is now becoming real by the day. Hmm. I will finish by one last example. The biggest possibility of destabilization and potential conflict will come from human displacement. Large-scale climate-induced human displacement is a matter of fact that is going to happen. It is very, very clear. We all know that is, is going to happen. Mm. Look at my own state, Bangladesh. It will lose 20% of its landmass to the sea due to sea level rise, according to IPCC's reports. And this is going to happen by 2050. When that happens, the Bangladesh strategy paper says that Bangladesh will create a climate refugee population of 30 million people. These are numbers which are massive to work with. We can't even cope with thousands of refugees. Now we are talking about 30 million refugees. Mm. That population cannot be internally absorbed in the small geographical space of Bangladesh. It will result in transboundary migration and probably beyond the region, which will completely destabilize the region completely bring new tensions in the international system and possibly a sort of destabilization at a regional scale that might erupt in conflict. Hmm. So this is a prospect which is not difficult to see now. Hmm. We can see the symptoms, we can see the picture, except that we are sometimes not ready to accept them. The possibility of human security is there and the potential for hard security is right on the doorsteps. Thank you very much, Major General. Uh, I think you have uh, quite effectively responded to this overall question, whether it's a hype uh, or not, uh, deflating the hype argument and really pointing to the real security uh, threats. You know, I also wanted to take the opportunity, I've been negotiating uh, uh, several resolutions in, in New York on these issues and, and an argument that often comes from the develop, uh, development world, the G77, uh, is that you know, there is a risk here of securitizing the climate agenda that is really a development agenda. What would you say to that? Uh, the fear that comes from many quarters or the skeptics is the involvement of the big militaries. Mm. So my contention is that there will be a need to securitize, but there will never be a point of militarization of climate change. The militaries are not capable of responding alone to climate risk and climate threats, 
but it is an important component of the national strategy to respond or the international strategy to respond. Mm. It cannot be kept out. And why we need to talk about it now? Because militaries are huge machines, very capable, very efficient, but massive machines. You cannot plug and play. If you have to give a task to the military, then you have to do it now, assign the mission to the military, so the military then does its own planning. It has to retrain in many areas, because it has not been trained to cope with climate change challenges. It's been trained to fight. It has not been trained to fight climate. So it has to train, it has to plan, it has to retool and re equip in many cases. But that process takes time. So therefore, we have to identify the threat now, find the role, the right role for the military, which will be, again, country-specific in many cases, so that when the time comes, the military is ready to go and operate. Thank you very much, May General. Fascinating insight. I'm sure there will be questions also from, from participants here to you uh, when we come to that part of the session. Now, I now turn to Major General Lena Maria Persson Herlitz. Um, uh, you, uh, well, a, a, a Swedish companion here on the panel. Uh, in the Foreign Office, we've been working actively on this agenda over the past few years. We first made this uh, a top priority during our Security uh, Council tenure, where we managed to bring um, these connections into uh, resolutions for the first time. We then brought this agenda to the OSCE presidency last year, uh, where the chairperson uh, managed to have conclusions at the ministerial uh, in December here in Stockholm. Uh, in the meantime, how have you been working on these issues uh, at the Defense Department? And, uh, you know, how are you taking up this in your work? So, thank you, and thank you for having me. The Swedish Armed Forces' work in the field of sustainability emanates, of course, from the UN Sustainable Development Goals and the National Environmental Quality Objectives. And the Swedish defense authorities have jointly decided upon strategies within the areas of energy, climate, chemicals, and also pollution to guide the environmental work within the defense sector. Mm. Despite the ongoing organizational efforts that are underway to tackle the challenging conditions caused by climate change, which I will come back to, it is important to reflect on the challenges and effects that climate change will have on the Swedish Armed Forces' operational capability and the organization's ability to grow and to uh, the security policy changes and shifts that may occur as a result of the uh, future uh, climate changes as well. So to this end, I will address three interlinked areas that I consider important in, in this regard. So first, the uh, climate change adaptation, which refers to the process of adjusting to current or expected eff effects of climate change. And like other governmental authorities in Sweden, the Swedish Armed Forces is obliged to perform a climate and threat analysis every five years. And we have targeted goals for its uh, own impact on climate change. We have action plan, and we also take into account climate adaptation during our uh, procurement procedures. And our next threat analysis is to be concluded by 24. And the Swedish total defense is dependent on a functioning society. Critical infrastructures such as ports, airports, railways, telecommunication and so on, fuel deposits, are essential for the total defense capability. And at the same time, they are vulnerable to the effects of climate-related uh, factors. So society's functionality and uh, robustness is therefore needs to be strengthened in order to be able to handle difficult pressure or uh, as a result of, for example, climate changes. So some concrete examples of how the Swedish Armed Forces operational capability can be affected includes, for instance, extreme weather conditions, affect military operations feasibility. For example, precipitation and heavy damper can limit the usage of runways. Mm. An increasing rate of humidity, cloudiness and fog in the atmosphere can hamper and limit usage of technical equipment. 
And climate is also considered to be a threat multiplier, as climate change is believed to be able to augment already existing crises and cause new conflicts. For example, lack of water and worsened condition for agriculture can lead to social distress, such as refugee waves, undermining of governance and criminality. And this may increase the need for humanitarian support and peacekeeping operations. Mm. And my second point involves the sustainable conversion of Swedish armed forces and the achievement of climate uh, neutrality. And the organization's development in this context of a global green conversion that challenges our established organizational system, development and the maintenance of our resources. And one example is the fact that our ability to perform includes security, and long-term, securing a long-term and secure energy and fuel supply. Mm. That is really important for, for us and our operational capability. So the Swedish Armed Forces primary source for direct greenhouse gas emission is the usage of fuel. And this is therefore a significant area where the Swedish Armed Forces can and is looking to contribute to our goal for climate neutrality. Studies by the armed forces have concluded that in the uh, short term, it is technically feasible to readjust to synthetic diesel substitute. Mm. And another challenge for uh, the armed forces is the, uh, and the society as a whole, I might say, is the contamination in form of PFAS. And this is a global problem and the armed forces has been at the forefront when it comes to producing decontamination measures to tackle this uh, issue. And these efforts have also caught the interest of other countries, uh, including the American and the Australian DOD. Mm -hmm. And lastly, my third point, climate and security, the geopolitical consequences of a green uh, conversion. And the shift from fossil to renewable energy is likely to create new power balances. States that are economically dependent on exporting fossil fuel may experience significant relief uh, relative dis disadvantages when oil is substituted by other sources of uh, energy. And this can lead to and create new conflicts mm. as access to energy and energy uh, sources is used as a mean of power where relationships of dependency can have security policy consequences as well. Mm. So to conclude, Climate change is one of our time's biggest challenges. It's not just a hype, uh, which demands international military cooperation. And we are therefore involving a range of multilateral collaborations, including uh, within the framework of um, EDA, uh, EU, NATO, and of course with our neighbors in the framework of uh, NORDEFCO, where we have green defense uh, working groups as well. So climate change, as addressed, affects and will continue to affect the Swedish Armed Forces' capability to act in a variety of ways. And it will require investments in technology and also technology development, as well as capability building initiatives. The shift from fossil fuels to alternative sources of energy will also, in addition to contributing to climate neutrality, also securing a long-term secure supply of energy and also lead to heightened resilience and less dependency. Mm. So moving forward, interoperability will be one of the key importance and uh, the collaboration with partners is crucial for the uh, collective defense capability. Thank you very much. I picked up on a lot of similarities actually with Melissa's uh, assessment uh, in terms of how this impacts the defense forces. Could you, uh, like Melissa did, also point to a couple of examples of how this operationally also impacts, like what do you do differently given this? Uh, uh, just briefly a couple of examples if you have. There is a lot of examples, but I would like to, to point to the, to the Arctic and uh, the new geostrategic circumstances when it comes to security policy. Um, the new access to, to the Arctic's uh, you know, national resources and the sea lines of communication. There is a, a, a total new front 
uh, that also Russia needs to, to secure in some way. And we all have Arctic uh, strategies, but very few of them are being resourced. Mm. And um, even if we don't want to militarize the Arctic, it's already ongoing. And um, I would say that the Russian activity and the military buildup to defend the uh, Russian territory and a growing number of non-Arctic states uh, expression interest in the region, uh, notably China, a common understanding and deep situational awareness is key. Uh, and to this end, the Swedish Armed Forces, we have, as one example, initiated a project with the global CCS, and that is the Carbon Capture and Storage mm -hmm. Inis Institute on climate change and security. So that is one of the uh, corporations that we are you know, involved in. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. I will now turn back to the entire panel here and go by one by one. If you will want to pick up and, uh, and comment on, on something uh, that uh, someone else on the panel have already said in this first round of, of comments. And, and I will uh, also add another question from me, and that's that one of the main threads of this uh, whole forum is that we need to bring different uh, uh, policy sectors together, uh, that we need to uh, bring those communities together to be more coherent, to be you know, more coordinated, working together, humanitarian development, peace, uh, defense. Um, is that the case uh, also uh, on climate, or would it be better to have uh, all of them you know, going about its own business and doing that very well? Climate on one hand, security on one hand, development on, on a third, doing their job very well, or uh, rather than waste time uh, trying to work together. That would be an additional question, but also please comment if there is other things you have picked up on. And I'll begin with you, Melissa. Great, uh, thank you so much. And uh, just wanted to also express appreciation for the, the really thoughtful uh, interventions by, by my fellow panelists. I think there are a lot of uh, common threads and uh, common points of conversation that we can build upon. Um, to, to answer your for your question, I do think it's actually imperative for us to be uh, weaving in climate considerations into our routine bilateral and multilateral discussions that, that we are having with allies and partners. Um, that is very much a focus of my team here in the Department of Defense, working closely with our regional colleagues that um, have the day-to-day -day stewardship of our bilateral and multilateral uh, defense commitments and, and uh, discussions. Um, so whether that's uh, NATO as, as a whole, um, whether it's working through um, alliance structures in the in Indo-Pacific, um, ASEAN, um, you know, those multilateral forums are going to be critical for us to achieve a common understanding of the particular threats and vectors that climate change presents, and then what collectively each of us um, is doing to be able to um, mitigate and anticipate uh, those, those trend lines, and then um, hopefully also to be able to identify ways for us to collaborate, um, whether that's information sharing about best practices or investments that we are making within our own structures, um, but also how we can better operate together in a more climate resilient fashion. Um, and, and if I may also just wanted to reinforce the, the terrific uh, comments on, on the Arctic. Um, as I mentioned before, that, that is a, a renewed focus for us um, here in, in the department and trying to, to better cohere a common approach uh, from the Defense Department when it comes to, to our Arctic policy um, to echo and, and reinforce my, my Swedish colleague in terms of, unfortunately, um, some worrisome developments that we see in terms of what the People's Republic of China is doing in the region uh, economically. Um, and then, of course, uh, on, the, on the Russian side, um, the, the security enhancements that they are making to their own posture and some of the, the political relationships that they are brokering um, at multiple levels are areas that we are closely watching um, and very much look forward to continuing a, a robust dialogue with, with our allies and partners in terms of better understanding those dynamics um, and how we can enhance the, the capabilities collectively in our force to be able to operate in cold weather conditions together. Thank you. Thank you, Melissa. Maybe just one very briefly. Are you coordinating with other policy communities, the development crowd, the humanitarians, uh, in the climate folks in Washington, D.C.? Is that, uh, or is that something you would wish to do more or less? 
I, I think there's certainly uh, more room for, for growth in that regard. We are in um, active and daily uh, conversations within the U.S. interagency with the Department of State, uh, USAID, and, and other uh, entities uh, in, the, in the civilian sector that play important roles uh, in diplomacy, in international development, uh, humanitarian assistance to really uh, provide a holistic approach to tackling the, the climate uh, crisis uh, abroad, as well as, frankly, uh, here, here at home working with our domestic agencies. Um, and, and also, we have robust and routine interactions with civil society and academic institutions. Um, we actually very strongly benefit from having uh, several members of our team on rotation with us um, from the academic and, and think tank communities as well uh, to, to bolster our expertise. Um, but certainly more, more room to grow in in that regard um, so we will look forward to that thank you uh, over to Kevin uh, and Ottawa if you want to pick up on something that other panelists have said or also on this question about trying to bring together the different um, policy communities well on the latter question um, bringing together the policy communities first of all I think there's a lot of work to be done to build uh, trust mutual trust and you know understanding about what, uh, what each of these sectors is able to do. Uh, I think that starts with um, a simple exchange of information um, and that uh, it's essential that militaries uh, know what development communities and humanitarian organizations uh, can bring to bear and vice versa. Um, very important to know who your potential partners are um, if a situation calls for, for tools that you just don't have. Um, so where interests intersect, um, sectors could work cooperatively, or at least in complementarity, um, to preserve, you know, the, the defense sector, for instance, can provide baseline security conditions. So if you can imagine a situation where there are human threats, there is active armed conflict or a threat of armed conflict, um, the military is there, of course, to, um, to preserve uh, the safety and the security of the space in which humanitarian and, and development actors can work in response to, to climate change uh, threats or, or natural disasters. Um, that's a delicate balance. Um, there are very well-founded allergies among uh, defense and humanitarian communities about being seen to be protected by uh, militaries, but uh, in some cases, it's just necessary for, um, for the benefit of... Um, of vulnerable uh, populations. Um, as a Canadian, I'd be remiss not to pick up on the Arctic uh, issue. Um, you know, of course, climate change is the greatest threat um, to the North American Arctic and the European uh, high north. Um, in the North American Arctic, and the Canadian Arctic at least, um, we don't see a near-term military threat. We don't think it is a, going to be a theater in, any, any, in the near term for actual conflict. But it is a place, as others have noted, um, where um, extraterritorial actors have interests. And so the issue for Canada, at least, is um, protecting and preserving our sovereignty uh, in, the, uh, in the Canadian Arctic. And that requires investments. Um, expect, huge, huge price tags attached to those investments, which will require uh, modernization of NORAD, um, more cooperation um, with our uh, NATO partners, uh, who are also uh, Arctic, uh, Arctic and Nordic countries, um, to ensure that we have the surveillance tools mm. to be able to respond to to those who might uh, who might challenge our sovereignty. Mm. Thank you very much. Over to you, General uh, Major General uh, Munir Utsaram. Um, I mean, you've, you've heard this conversation before, I'm, uh, but is there anything specific that you want to pick up on uh, that you've heard from your panelists? What I, am, I would like to say is that, personally, I'm not happy with the way we are behaving. The nature of the problem is very different, very vast. These are global problems. These are civilizational problems. But we are behaving in very nationalistic manner in some cases, super nationalistic manner. These problems cannot be solved by the Westphalian system of state we have built for ourselves. It needs far greater understanding of human civilization and its needs. We'll probably be there, but at very high cost. Because I see that as the problem increases, everybody becomes more nationalistic, and they look inwardly. It should be the other way around. 
You should be, we should be looking out outwardly. We should be cooperating on multilateral basis. We should be co cooperating as a continent. We should be, there should be intercontinental cooperation. I'll just give you an anecdotal memory. I was involved in a multilateral, very large war game on, on climate change. At the end of the day, third day, every country or the country groups that were represented mathematically became super nationalistic. To an extent, a picture that was painted to them was mass migration of people coming across the sea. And a decision that was collectively taken by some of the groups was that we will go to the sea and carry out controlled genocide. So that is a response. Human beings must need to open up to the challenge. States need to open up to the challenge. This is a different kind of a ball game. We've not played this before. We have to be innovative, think out of the box, cooperate amongst ourselves. Then only we can survive as a species. Thank you. Thank you very much, May General, for, for drawing uh, attention to the seriousness of, of the challenge. Indeed, a generational challenge, as you said, that require more uh, international cooperation, not less. Uh, indeed, that's certainly something that my government would sign up on, and partly the reason why we've called together this conference uh, this week. Uh, I think also, colleagues, please uh, prepare yourself if there are any questions from the audience. Also, those of you who are watching online, Steph will help me pick up some questions from there. But I would round off this, uh, or to, to just close this round uh, with the Major General, if you have any uh, comments on what you've picked up from the other panelists in the meantime. A lot of wise things has already been said, but in this complex strategic environment that we actually live in right now, everything is interconnected. So to tackle climate change, it's not for the uh, defense forces alone or for anyone else alone. We need to get, do it together. And there is no security without uh, development, but there will be no development without security. So that's where we are connected. And I also would like to pick up on the uh, Arctic uh, comments. Um, we have a, a war in, in Ukraine and uh, we don't see a military threat up in the Arctic either. But the uh, concern is if there will be any spillover effects up there. And um, also mentioned the situation awareness is so important that we actually know what's going on. So we, we know what to prepare for. Mm. And um, we need to not only keep our eyes on the ball, we need to look at the whole playing field. Mm. Thank you very much. I know that uh, the chair of CIPRI, who opened this conference yesterday, will be very happy that you referenced uh, that there won't be any peace without development, no peace without, um, or there won't be any peace without development, no development without peace. He would have added also none of the above without human rights and the respect for human rights. But uh, with that, I open the floor. If there are any uh, one in the audience who would like to pose a question, I see one here and over there. Uh, maybe you want to start with one over there and then come over to this side. Uh, and again, if there is anyone also listening online who wants to come in, let's take maybe three questions uh, or four, and then we turn back uh, to the panel for a final round. So please help me, those of you with, um, with microphones. Should we start here then? Yeah. I, you seem ready to go. Yeah, with, with pleasure. Uh, Anna Tervahartila from a Finnish security think tank, Elisabeth Rehn, Bank of Ideas. Uh, I'm very delighted to have this panel or to, to listen to the comments. On the other, other hand, I'm slightly horrified because what the human rights and humanitarian sector has seen is the securitization of, of for example, uh, many topics or, or let's say the securitization of development uh, initiatives and so forth. Um, one of the topics that I myself follow is, for example, the discussion regarding migration in Finland, which is, I see that it's kind of being securitized very much. I was recently in a security conference where, for example, hybrid warfare and the use of migration as a tool um, was voiced, and the panel did not once touch on, on human rights or, for example, the right to seek asylum. And also knowing that in the current refugee convention, climate change or is not a factor would, that would give a right for asylum. So I would like to hear your thoughts regarding um, what can be done that um, securitization of, um, let's say, displacement or migration topics does not go further um, and rights are protected. 
Thank you. Uh, so, any questions from over here? I um, first of all, thank you so much. This subject is very close to my mind. I was uh, finished my assignment six years as a deputy special representative uh, of MINUSMA in Mali, one of the biggest mission. And I like very much what uh, this topic was saying. Climate, development, security, humanitarian have to work together. There is no way that uh, we work in silo. Uh, I discussed earlier, I had the chance to discuss with the President of Bangladesh Institute. And what you are saying is so much in mind of human security. I think the military, uh, just to write a comment, the human displacement, the destabilization is very much on the agenda. I think we need to go more and more in analysis. And I think the military and the people working like in a mission or, or you know, civilian and government, we have to plan together. Otherwise, we maybe miss some of the issue we don't see very much. I think this climate refugee population is very much on agenda like in Sahel region I work in for six years. So mm -hmm. I really beg for this session, which is very, very much important, the hard security perspective is also how people can work in coherence and cooperation and uh, a lot of collaboration, not in silo, but working together. So the moderator, you ask a question, when the militarization versus development, I think this is really the topic you can push like a simply that uh, people in New York should listen that uh, we cannot work in silo. Security Council, ECOSOC has to listen to each other mm. and plan together. And the donors who are giving money must also listen and see together, otherwise we're gonna lose our planet. Thank you. Thank you very much. Anyone else from over there? I saw some hands waving. Oh, we have one right here. Perfect. Thank you very much, Cipri, Government of Sweden, again, for this wonderful panel. My name is Marit Kopetis from the EU. I have two questions. Um, the discussion on how the military can contribute to address the negative conflicts of um, aspects of climate change is often stopped by the mantra, but we can not, never, redline sacrifice operational effectiveness. Now, um, I'm an outsider. For me, it's a unique opportunity to be able to ask questions to you directly. We have a rough understanding as outsiders of what operational effectiveness means. If you have a military, you must be able to shoot. Um, but um, it is clearly at odds with the need to reduce CO2 emissions and military being large emitters. Can you give us some examples of how you address this dilemma? Because something has to budge. And, and, and can you give examples of how you're doing this? And the second question is, could you also give some examples of how you're applying this green thinking in your militaries to your um, international support to militaries? Um, all of you do external security sector uh, governance, um, um, reform supports. All of you are exporting arms to, 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 to situations. Um, how do you apply your green thinking there? Thank you. Mm. Thank you very much. Uh, any final question from the audience? No? And Steph, no one from online? Or one question? Just, just to add from our online on audiences, two interesting aspects I found. One was about the organizations uh, it's themselves on the military side. Do you experience internal challenges still in making the case for the scope mm. of this challenge? Mm. And the second aspect, which I also found very interesting on the issue of trust, which came up. What would be a good North-South collaboration to increase trust? Excellent questions. Uh, I'm not sure if we'll have the, the time to cover all of it. Uh, we have some 20 minutes uh, to go. Uh, it was the issue of securitization of, of uh, climate, which we touched on before. Uh, the importance of coherence, uh, coordination, which I kind of provoked you on before as well. Uh, certainly from uh, the point of view in Mali, it, wasn't, uh, it didn't seem like a waste of time, as I was suggesting. Um, you also pointed to the importance of displacement as part of this, something that has not been commented upon uh, before. Um, uh, the issue of operational uh, effectiveness, uh, including the issue of emittances. Um, 
Green thinking also in your support to other defense forces, as I understand, including security sector reform. Um, internal challenges to make the case. Uh, uh, is there resistance? And then the final question on trust, north-south, uh, if, uh, you know, how that um, uh, division that I alluded to before also uh, could be overcome, but also if there are elements of, of actually forging stronger uh, partnership and cooperation across that uh, divide uh, on these issues. Um, maybe I'll do the other way uh, uh, around this time, and I begin with you, Lena, Major General, uh, Person Herlitz, if you want to, to, to start um, and pick up on the questions that you, you know, prefer to respond to, and then we'll see if we cover them all as we go through the panel. Over to you. It was a lot of uh, questions, but I will try to at least answer a few of them. And uh, starting with the hybrid activities and migration uh, as a tool. And when it comes to, to that, yeah, the adversary's toolbox is getting you know, broader and broader when it comes to not only war-like um, tools, but also um, civilian uh, hybrid tools to use. And I think we just get, we have to get used to them because they will, uh, they will keep uh, using hybrid activities, you know, sub-threshold activities uh, under the um, level of war, and uh, we just need to handle it. That is mm, at least my view. We will see more and more of that as well. And when it comes to operational effectiveness, and um, I think it's important that new technology is mainly developed by the civilian side now and then we adapt it to, to military use. And for us, we need to utilize all the good technology coming from the civilian side into our military use, and also to look at it as a green defense. And when we are conducting soft talks with other nations, as we do often, one of the points is always green defense and how we can support each other to be more you know, environmental friendly. And when it comes to the younger generation, um, especially those who are uh, in the age for their conscription. This is an important issue for them. They have a lot of questions when it comes to the environment and the green defense and how we can develop. So, and for that, that is a recruiting issue for us. We need to be good at those issues as well, because we want to, to be able to recruit more you know, personnel when it comes to, to the youth. And um, so is there any internal challenges? I would say no. We all recognize that this is a real threat. There are here and now threats, but there is also long-term threats. And the climate change is definitely one of the threats that we are um, you know, uh, trying to do our part, at least, to, to be as good as possible. And something concrete, I mentioned it before, we are looking into replacing our fossil fuel with the synthetic uh, diesel, for instance. So that is, is one way that we could, you know, support and do our bit. Excellent. Major General, over to you. Thank you. Uh, I would rather agree with your statement, Madam, when you've made the first question. Uh, right to migrate under stress of any condition is a human right. Unfortunately, we are not dealing with the uh, climate issue and migration in the proper prospects. Because if you see the uh, migration conventions, there is recognition of all categories of migrants except environmental or climate migrants. So it's just, we are in a state of denial. Migration is going to happen. I can write it down, migration will happen. Let it happen under a well-planned, well-orchestrated manner so that it does not become a massive security issue. So we need to recognize the problem and deal with it and don't be in a state of denial. And in that, human rights play the most critical role. They should be above everything. Though no state, no organization has the right to weaponize migration. That is illegal. And we must treat the migrants. Normally, we all treat migrants in a different manner, but nobody wants to migrate. Several international studies have indicated that nobody wants to migrate Everybody wants to live in the place they have lived for generations, unless they're forced to, for whatever reason. So therefore, we need better understanding, and we perhaps need more empathetic understanding of the issue. And that is what it calls for. 
I agree with our colleague from the UN that togetherness, togetherness amongst humanitarian operators, military operators, and a whole of society and a whole of states approach and a whole of international communities approach is the only way to deal with this problem. The, the issue and the problem is so vast that we cannot fragment this, but we need to cooperate and coordinate better. I see that the issue of the pollution by the military is huge. The military as an institution globally is the largest polluter. No other organization pollutes like the military. It is all the equipments that we use, the aircrafts that we fly, or the ships we sell are huge polluters. I see one statistics. Uh, the US military pollutes more than the, or emits more than the whole country of Sweden. One single military. But it is not easy to transform such a huge machine. But I know that several good steps are being taken by large militaries in finding out alternative fuel for his ships and aircrafts, changing his equipment pa patterns, changing the training patterns in the way troops train. So militaries are also, as an institution, the most aware of the consequences internally and externally to their pollution or to their mission. And they have done internally much better than many, many other organizations or big corporations. So give credit to the military for that. But it is a large machine. It will take a while to reduce its emission. What I call the military is the world's, has the largest pollution footprint, and we need to reduce that. Hmm. Thank you very much again, uh, Major General, for a fascinating insight. I then turn to Ottawa and uh, Kevin for, to pick up on some of the questions that were just posed. Well, I'll pick up on, on exactly uh, that point. Um, the question of militaries having um, a tendency to push against the idea of sacrificing operational effectiveness. The, the solution is to turn that question around and say, how can green technologies improve operational effectiveness? How can militaries be more effective fighting force by uh, by adopting green technologies? And we're seeing that in, in a lot of uh, militaries, certainly in Canada, more solar powered uh, comms equipment uh, and, and material, um, a doctrine where we more um, frequently pre-position equipment and supplies in different parts of the world so we don't have to continuously um, increase our, fo uh, our fossil fuel, fuel footprint uh, by ferrying equipment needlessly around constantly. So there, there has been adaptation, but of course, like anything, you have to uh, demonstrate to the actor involved how it how it benefits them. Um, building trust uh, between uh, North and South in particular, um, I think that can come through through our training programs. Um, we do a lot of training of um, militaries in, in the Global South uh, to do that in a way, particularly when uh, they're being trained and provided with equipment to respond to natural disasters in their own countries that are brought about by climate change. Um, you know, can we equip them, first of all, with the equipment itself, the physical equipment, but also the um, uh, doctrinal capacity to respond to issues like gender needs, uh, the needs of children, the needs of vulnerable uh, communities in the context of a natural disaster where there may be um, insecurity um, uh, mixed in with that. Um, I think that is that training, those training relationships can be strengthened and that could be a good way to, uh, to enhance trust. I'll leave it there. Thank you very much, Kevin. And over to Melissa to pick up on the remaining questions. I also heard that the US military is emitting more than Sweden together. Can that be true? And what is done to, uh, to, uh, to address that? Uh, thank you so much uh, for, for the terrific questions. Um, I will address that, that one first and then also try to tick through a, a number of them because they were all tr truly excellent. Um, in, in a world of, of rising energy prices and contested logistics over delivering fuel to our force, the department is increasingly recognizing that the more efficient use of energy is not only good for the environment, but also necessary for the success of, of the mission. So um, we actually see a strong interconnection between operational effectiveness 
um, and the need to be more climate resilient. Um, we are a large consumer of fuel and our installations require um, quite a bit of electricity, um, but the administration is uh, taking a number of concrete steps um, to, to address uh, these dependencies. President Biden signed an executive order on sustainability which will help drive innovation and more far-reaching efforts by the Department of Defense, as well as depart other departments and agencies to reduce emissions of greenhouse gases and improve our operational performance. Um, and it reflected in the budget, uh, which really tells you how we're going to, to resource this, um, includes key investments in technology improvements to enhance the energy efficiency of military systems. This includes funding for new aircraft designs, increased electrification of non-tactical vehicles, as well as investments in microgrids to improve the resilience of our installations and reduce their environmental impact. In addition, our Deputy Secretary of Defense on Earth Day recently issued a memo that prioritized actions to reduce the department's energy use and improve efficiency, an operational imperative given soaring energy prices and how dangerous and difficult it can be to provide fuel to our forces in, in the field. Um, so a lot of work remains, uh, but we are taking concrete steps in, in the right direction. To address uh, some of the other excellent questions of, on the question of, of migration. Um, to take a step back to a very strategic level, um, early on in this administration, President Biden issued a national security strategic guidance, which made very clear uh, that diplomacy is the tool of first resort uh, for the United States. Um, and that's a bit of a play on um, the classic uh, line that the military is the tool of, of last resort. And I think that um, overarching policy view um, really has infused our, our approaches uh, to a number of foreign policy issues to include uh, migration uh, crises, including here in, in our own hemisphere, um, in terms of the Department of Defense really playing a supporting role to a holistic whole of government allied and partner based approach to tackling um, these types of complex challenges and migration um, is requires that that type of approach, given how multifaceted it is um, to ensure that it is humane um, and strategic in in the foreign policy application. Um, in addition, Vice President Harris um, has issued a uh, root causes of, of migration strategy uh, for how we can holistically uh, address as a government and working with allies and partners uh, the migration crisis here in our, our hemisphere um, to try to work upstream um, on a humanitarian basis, on an economic development basis, on a good governance basis, um, and how that then dovetails actions that the Department of Defense can take in support um, using our security cooperation tools to equip our, our partners in the region to take a responsible approach to, to the migration crisis. Um, so just to, to share a bit of context in terms of, of how we're thinking about um, that application and uh, you know the connection to, to climate um, is profound in terms of uh, some of the, the um, food scarcity and, and droughts and uh, severe weather impacts that can be a strong driver unfortunately for migration patterns whether it's here um, in this hemisphere or in other parts of, of the world. Um, also wanted to address the, the great question in terms of um, how the US military or other militaries can work with allies and partners to, to address climate. Um, we are increasingly looking to how we can weave uh, climate considerations, climate resilience into our core security cooperation uh, activities with, with allies and partners. When we train and equip and conduct exercises um, and seek to build greater interoperability with our allies and partners, we are weaving in uh, those climate considerations increasingly um, to ensure that um, we are on the, not only on the same sheet of music, uh, but that in a crisis or contingency that we could operate well together um, and in a climate resilient fashion. Um, and then uh, just in terms of the uh, internal challenges uh, question, a really, really great one. Uh, I believe that we have been able to overcome what has been in the past um, quite a lot of opposition uh, in some sectors of, of the Department of Defense um, due to very strong leadership 
um, on the part of Secretary Austin and Deputy Secretary Hicks um, to continually emphasize the importance of climate as a core strategic consideration woven through our strategy, um, woven through our investments, um, such that uh, the most recent uh, defense budget has over $3 billion um, in commitments to, to address uh, climate um, and, and to get um, our, our forces positioned in a way to be able to better think, plan, and operate effectively in a climate-resilient fashion. Thank you very much. Thank you, Melissa. We have now come, we have some four minutes left, but I wanted to do a quick kind of concluding round. Uh, you will have some 30 seconds each to you know, point to what your main takeaway from the discussion today would be. And maybe I'll begin with you, uh, Major General uh, uh, Persson, uh, if you can uh, begin and then over to Melissa and Kevin. I think we have uh, answered the question, is this a real threat or a hype? It is uh, you know, a real threat. Mm. And uh, the, uh, the climate change is one of our time's you know, biggest challenges. And uh, as I can see it and as I understand it, you know, there is an, an, an understanding, but there is also a will to tackle the problem. Uh, and that will demand you know, cooperation internationally and also between military and civilian side. And to use the new technology that mainly emanates from the civilian side to be used in the military as well to... to uh, um, reduce our um, footprint when it comes to uh, the environment. Thank you. And we need to have a whole of a government approach. Thank you very much. Very short and succinct. Over to you, Melissa, and then Kevin. Thank you very much for the opportunity to, to engage with you all uh, today. Um, I think the big takeaway from, from my perspective is that um, we need to continue to ensure that uh, climate is front and center in, in security considerations, that it's a core part of our strategy development and, and how we resource our, our strategies, um, but that we, we can't tackle this, this challenge alone, um, given how complex um, the security issues are, whether it's, it's it's migration, um, whether it's um, severe uh, droughts or uh, severe weather impacts, um, these are going to be complex challenges that will require mobilizing diplomacy, humanitarian development, as well as the security uh, dimension together. Um, and so leveraging um, not only standing bodies of allied and partner engagements, um, but also thinking creatively about how we can uh, better foster dialogue, common understanding and action will be imperative for all of us. Thank, Thank you. you Melissa. Over to Kevin. Sure, I, I can be brief. I, th I think my, my biggest takeaway is um, the security and climate change not only requires a whole of government response, but a whole of society uh, response. And, and the fact is that um, our militaries and our um, development agencies, our humanitarian um, uh, providers, uh, humanitarian assistance providers, all have different <clears throat> tools. Uh, we need to understand what those tools are, make them as complementary as possible, and ensure that uh, we are well joined up uh, to respond uh, holistically to the challenges that uh, climate change is going to bring for all of us. Thank you, Kevin. And Major General, uh, you have the final word. What's your takeaway? Thank you. It's been a very rich discussion, so there are several takeaways, but I will only confine that these are complex and compound problems. And sometimes the uh, impacts of climate change to security are non-linear. So therefore, our political masters sometimes don't identify them as the sources of the tensions and the conflict that is coming. So that needs to be understood, but it needs far greater understanding. It needs far greater international cooperation, multilateral cooperation, and only then we can come up with an international response to climate change. The only thing that worries me is that we don't have that sense of urgency. What we are talking here today should have actually happened much before. Everything should have been on the ground yesterday. Not, we should not be talking about the issues today. We need far better practical actions. We need things to happen on the ground, not only on paper or talking in the conferences. We need implementation. That sense of urgency must sink in if we want to survive. Thank you. I think that's uh, an excellent conclusion. And
The only thing that remains for me then is to really just thank you for bringing these uh, hard security voices uh, to this forum and I'm sure that your perspectives will be taken forward in the meetings uh, to come uh, today and tomorrow. So again, thank you and I suggest another big applause for our participants. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much.